And welcome back to the 2023 Detroit Deadline Show. What a show we've had so far. Want to remind you all, we do have a comment section here. So if you want, we're going to get to some of the comments after the Brian McCray interview. But if you want to go ahead and leave your comments, please go ahead and do so. You can do so on whatever platform you're on. We are welcome it. And we'll interact with you as much as we can. Our next guest is a very special guest. Second straight year, he's on our MLB trade deadline show. He's been on Francis Speaking Sports a couple other times. Let's welcome in former switch hitting MLB outfielder, played for the Royals, Cubs, Mets, Rockies, and Blue Jays. Let's welcome in Brian McCray. Brian, how you doing, buddy? I'm good, thank you. Good afternoon. How you guys doing? Well, we're doing, doing well, great, sir. Brian. Brian, I want to start out by asking you a question that you're probably the best person to ask this question. Because not only did you play in the major leagues, but your dad played in the major leagues as well. So I want you to tell the fans that are listening here, you know, they don't necessarily realize what trade or what happens when a player is involved in a trade from a family situation, you know, about how it affects kids, and your dad was traded a couple of times in his career. Tell the fans out here, let's start first, not from just when you played as a player, but as a young kid growing up and your dad being traded, t- tell the fans how it affects so much more than just going from one team to another team, but how it affects the kids that are involved. Well, the, the good thing about my dad's situation was when he was traded from the Reds to the Royals, it was in the off season. So that's a little bit easier to adjust to. You have a little bit more time. I think it was in December, <clears throat> excuse me, when that trade went down. So it didn't affect the family and disrupt things as much as getting traded during the season. I was traded once in the off season and twice during the season. And when you get traded during the season, you just have to, go and change things on the fly. And, um, you know, that that's what's a little bit tougher when you're leaving behind your kids and your spouse or girlfriend and, and things of that nature. So I, I was very fortunate that uh, when I was younger, it didn't affect us, the trade from the Reds to the Royals that much. Um, and then the twice when I got traded, when I, when I got traded mid season, it was a, uh, you know, big disruption and, what uh, what you had going on in your daily routine. And the player, it's easy for the player to just pick up and go. And the family, it takes weeks, sometimes months, for them to get everything back on track. Brian, the, the one thing that, and it's non-trade deadline related, but I, I've done some work in, in summer collegiate wood bat, and a little birdie told me that this league, be the Coastal Plain League, you you saw some time there as a coach uh, yes, with the Moorhead City with the Moorhead City Marlins down on the coast here in North Carolina. Talk about um, you know we always hear about the Cape Cod League and its development towards Major League Baseball, but I feel like a lot of people don't talk enough about the CPL. Talk about the talent uh, that comes through that league each and every summer. It was a pretty good league. It's not the caliber of the first round picks and guys like that, but it was the players that would be going to the Cape Cod League in the next year or two. So that was uh, you know, it was exciting to see the freshmen that probably didn't play a whole lot at their colleges or the redshirt guys that needed some more time in the summer. So I caught them a year or two before they got on the scene as far as being draftable or going to the, the coastal plant or going to the uh, Cape Cod League. And that's an important yeah. period for those folks to development wise, right? Yes. And the only thing that I didn't like about the Coastal Plain League, we didn't play series. It was all one offs. Right. So you didn't have a lot of time to do extra work sometimes when you don't have two or three games in a row at home and you're on the buses and going back and forth and getting back at three or four o'clock in the morning. It's tough to get your work in. But uh, but when we were home we were able to do a lot of uh, work and get those guys up to speed with what they needed to do when they went back. You know, I wanted to make sure they got back to their colleges 
teams for fall ball more prepared to, to play and play a significant role on their teams than they were when they uh, when they got to me at the beginning of the summer. Hey, Brian, how, how happy and excited are you to see the running game back in Major League Baseball? It's exciting to see. I don't like the the rule about you can only throw over X amount of times. Right. You know, I think what Major League Baseball tried to do and is trying to do to speed up the game with all the with the time clock and things like that, then that's enough. Why are you going to put guys at a disadvantage as, as the pitchers when they can only throw over X amount of time and the catchers are at a bit disadvantage. Catchers can't throw anybody out now, and guys are running wild. So I think that needs to be um, modified a bit. But I, I like that you know the running game is is back, and, and and teams are trying to trying to steal more bases and and do more of that. But I I just don't like the fact that you have to dictate how many times a pitcher can throw over because that that's what a pitcher's tool is to try to you know, negate guys that, that run, and you can't really take away from that. And it's hurting pitchers' ERA, and it's hurting p- pitchers getting paid probably. Yeah, Brian, that's the biggest thing for me in terms of, you know, and Larry and I have talked about it. There's teams uh, across baseball that are, you know, well utilizing these rule changes in terms of getting their running games going. It's teams like the Marlins and the Diamondbacks and some of the younger teams like that, but you know, the, the pickoff rule, I feel like, is the one big miss uh, in terms of all these rule changes because once the pitcher throws over twice, you know, the first base coach holding the stopwatch, timing the pitcher's motion to the plate, it becomes null. It's it's basically Nothing. free reign to take off whenever he wants. Right. Right. And it, it's just like I said, you're, you're, taking, you're taking a weapon away from the pitchers. You're taking a weapon away from the catchers. And ultimately, that's going to be money taken away from them, inflated ERA. And then when you look at the matrix, if you're a catcher, they're going to say, well, you never threw anybody out or you can't throw anybody out. So that's costing guys on something that I don't think should be there because they put other things in place to speed up the pace of play. Pitchers throwing over to first base was not the reason why games were going three hours and 20 minutes. Right. Right, and you know, the other thing that I I despise, and Brett knows that I've talked to him many times, is I cannot stand this putting a runner on second base, which is thought extra innings. What is your thoughts on that? Uh, a lot aligned with everybody that I've talked to, too. They don't like it. And if you put other safeguards in place to move the game along, why do you need to put a runner at second base? I don't, I don't, I don't get it. That that doesn't make that doesn't make sense to me to get to that point. I would be better off if they were ties. I'm okay with a yeah, tie. Brian, I don't want to Brian, I, I'm with you. And- a game earlier this year between the, the I can't remember who Cleveland was playing, but. It went 15, 16 innings uh, because in the top of the inning, the away team would, you know, find a way to advance the guy to third and come home on a single or a sack fly. That would be the only run of the inning. Bottom half of the inning, Cleveland would scratch one across and tie it, and we keep going. It, it, you know, the, the rule, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't move things along. It just adds more runs to the total, and it makes these relievers' ERAs go up because they're giving up a run every 10th, 11th, 12th inning. The cycle yeah, you're just give up, repeats You're almost itself. guaranteed to give up a run. And it just, to me, like I said, if they just went with ties, I would be fine with it because then it would make teams try to do more to score runs in that later third of the, of the ball game and not just try to hold on and get to the extra extra innings. So, you know, th- there's still some things that need to be modified with what they're trying to do, the pace of play. I think there's enough that has been put in place to where you shouldn't have to have any rules about how many times a pitcher can throw over. And you should just play extra innings 
Because in the playoffs, extra innings are just regular extra innings. Right. So why make a regular season game different than what you're doing to the postseason? No, I agree. I agree with you a hundred percent. So we'll keep we might as well just keep on this topic. You were a player for many years. What would you think in today's game if you were playing about robotic umpires? Well, I think the reason why the that's just behind home plate. And I think the major reason why that's been talked about or floated around is at some point in time, there's going to be sports books in all the ballparks and you're going to be able to gamble on each pitch in baseball. And you don't want a human back there when there's so much money on the line and at stake. So there's going to be an automatic strike zone and that's going to be there because of gambling. You're going to take all the human element out of strikes and balls because that's the only place I think an umpire can really influence a game and get, you know, can get kind of shady if you get the home plate umpire because he's involved in almost everything with balls and strikes. So you get that out of the way. You put a computer there. The guys that gamble can't get upset at the computer. The computer is what it is. There's no human back there to take the wrath of guys losing a bunch of money on a ball and strike call. So I think that's where where we're going with it and why it's been slowly implemented in the minor leagues is because, you know, we're going to have that app on our phone where we can bet, strike a ball on every pitch within the next five years. Probably. You know, you handled pressure pretty well. I have to say that uh, because, first of all, you played for the same team as your father played for. Okay. You also played for your father for the same team that he played for. And then you had your best career on the highest stage in the Big Apple. My first question to you is about that is did you feel more pressure on yourself as a player when your dad was managing you than when he wasn't managing you? Well, I felt. Like there was different degrees of pressure that I felt at different times in the big leagues. First, getting to the big leagues, you feel the pressure of, I heard I was only going to be up for two weeks. And then I get sent back down to either triple A or double A. I came up from double A. So it's pressure of trying to hold on and see how long you can stay in the big leagues. Once I got to the point where I felt I was getting established, then my father was the manager. And so that brings on a whole different, uh, you know, different things of pressure because I want to do well for myself. I want to do well for my father, you know, being the manager of the team. And then you want the team to do well because I was starting to establish myself in the big leagues at that point. And then going to New York and, and playing in Chicago and New York, it's just, you're on the biggest, the biggest stage, you know, Chicago, WGN, you know, on TV every day and in New York, you know, you play well in New York, the whole world knows about it. You play bad in New York, the whole world knows about it. So it's a different type of pressure at different levels. But I was lucky enough to start my career in Kansas City and not in New York or Chicago. So I think that prepped me for what I was yeah, but Brian, uh, but Brian, you had, I mean, going to have to do. In New York, Larry, Larry, if if Larry, if I can break in here, big trade just happened. Houston Astros have acquired Justin Verlander, return unknown. But Jeff Passan, Bob Nightingale, multiple reporters saying the deal is done. Justin Verlander's back in Houston. Wow, and we'll talk about that. Big, big news. Houston Astros could definitely use that. Verlander's been pitching well of late. Um, but I was saying, you're you're. New York, you played for, you had, I think it was 98, if I'm correct, 159 yeah. games, yeah, 90, 98. 146 hits, 21 homers, 79 RBIs, 20 stolen bases, 80 walks, and you batted 264. Not that you didn't have, you know, great years any of the other years, but what was so different about that year than all the other years? Well, well, one was the lineup that I was in. 
with Mike Piazza and John Olrude. I started off in the leadoff spot, and then as the year went on, I got moved down in the order. So I was hitting around two of the best players in baseball, and teams were more focused on Olrude and Piazza than me. So I had RBI opportunities almost twice a game, and I was the guy that they were going to pitch to in certain situations where they weren't going to pitch to Old Rude or Piazza. So I, I, I took advantage of a situation that I'd never been in in my career where I was a run producer and not hitting at the top of the order, and I was surrounded by two of the best bats in the league. So my success is pretty much all contributed to two players and Mike Piazza and John Olrude. Yeah, Brian, I wanted to ask you about your time with the Mets and what it was like to play in, in the NL East at a time when the Braves just absolutely dominated it. And, you know, your Mets were, it seemed like, always on the cusp uh, and, you know, would work their way in as a wild card team from time to time. But the battles that you guys had really, I, I think, rivaled Red Sox, Yankees in it from a National League perspective in terms of of intensity of rivalry. Talk about uh, how intense uh, those battles were. Well, I don't think it was a rivalry for the Braves because they beat up on us. You know, we, we were battling with them, but they, they pretty, they pretty much, they handled us those three years that I was in, uh, in New York. We couldn't, we couldn't really get past them. And, and the other team that got us in the East were the Montreal Expos. We struggled with with Montreal. We had pretty good success against everybody else in the division, but uh, the Braves. I don't think we won in the three years I was there. I think we might have won two games or three games down in Atlanta. We really struggled with them, and then we were right around five hundred against Montreal. But Montreal beat us in some key games late in the season in '98 uh, that uh, kept us out of kept us out of the playoffs. That that one game playoff between the the Cubs and the, and the Giants. So it, it was tough. The, the whole Eastern division, you had the pitching there at the Braves. You had the talent there with the, with the Expos and they could always sneak up and, and bite you. And it just wasn't a good matchup for us for whatever reason with those team with those two teams. And one other thing I wanted to, to, you know, kind of get your thoughts and pick your brain on a little bit, you know, you and your dad both spent a lot of time in Kansas city, me, uh, being a Cardinals guy and my family being from the St. Louis area, of course, we I know as well as anybody else that how the I-70, you know, rivalry and, and the series has gone. Not necessarily a rivalry. It's been more friendly than anything else. But one thing that I think gets lost in the grand scheme of baseball because of their lack of success the past few years is how passionate the fans are there in Kansas City. And when you see uh talent like Bobby Witt Jr. and this team kind of starting to build things up a little bit more. Talk about the fan base there in Kansas City and how good it's going to be and how exciting and good for baseball it's going to be when they can finally have a winner inside Kauffman Stadium. Well, I think you saw, took a, took a good look at the 14 and 15 teams when they went to the World Series back-to-back and saw the excitement and – you know, there were people who waited 30 years uh, from the 85 World Series. You know, when I came up in 90, that team was still pretty good coming off the 85 World Series when they were in the playoffs, I think, as a kid, you remembered the, the teams were really good here in Kansas City. From 76 to 85, they went to the world or they went to the playoffs almost every year. So that was something that younger generation like myself, we took it for granted that the Royals were going to have a good team going into the 90s and, and beyond, and that just didn't happen. Uh, if, if the social media era, ESPN, and all that was around when the Royals started playing well in, in 76, you would be talking about what kind of dynasty they had, and if the Yankees weren't so good, the Royals might have had a couple more World Series titles. They played the Yankees in 76, 77, 78, 
and 80. And they only beat the Yankees once in that in that span. And that was some of the best teams in Royals history. So I, I think that the, you know you you can get that fever back again. It looks like they're gonna have a new stadium within the next five or six years and with some of the young players that they have. And you know, this year they were hoping to be around five hundred and it just didn't it didn't work out and it's been terrible. But I do see some better things on the horizon. And this is a good baseball town, as shown when the team was good in 14 and 15. Yeah. Well, you know, like I said, you know, it's trade deadline day. Uh, you know, it's not one of the most popular days in, uh, you know, in uh, necessarily the players' uh, eyes. Um, some players just went from last place to first place, though. Well, yes, you can look at it that way, um, especially Verlander now. He's in a situation <laughs> where he can win. But, you know, talk about, you know, how tough it was on this day for players. And what was the most, as a player, when you were in the clubhouse, what was the most memorable trade that you remember? Oh, uh, probably the Mike Piazza trade. And it wasn't a deadline deal, but coming from when he got traded from the Dodgers to the Marlins for like a week and a half, and then the Marlins flipped him and traded him to the Mets. That was the biggest that I that I was a part of deal, and that wasn't a, a deadline deal. Deadline deal wise, I don't remember too many huge deadline deals that um, the teams that I was on. But uh, the Piazza one was was big because that was a franchise changing deal. We had Todd Hundley, who was injured, who had just come off breaking uh, a single season record for the most home runs by, I think, a National League catcher. And then he blew his arm out. So they went from one catcher that was getting ready to be an iconic figure in, in New York to bring it in Piazza. And he just took it and ran, ran off. And, uh, you know, to be around when that happened and, and the buzz in an organization in that city, when they were able to uh, get Mike Piazza was something that, um, you know, I, I think a lot of clubs have been able to make moves like that. The Padres with Soto, maybe if he stays and, and does well, but I don't know what other team has made a splash like that with that type of player being able to get him. And I think that was in May or June when we when we got uh, Piazza in, in like '98. So uh, you know that was that was something that was very very vivid in my memory. As this is this is a big deal. All right. Anything else for you, Brett? I think we hit the nail on the head with all that, Larry. Yeah, we sure did. Well, listen, Brian, I want to thank you so very, very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to I join appreciate us. It. All right, my friends, stay safe, and thanks again. All right, enjoy the rest of your trade deadline and, uh, and the season, and we'll talk soon. All right, my friend, thanks again.